this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and I'm going to be continuing my Fisher vs. Kasparov series on the Nidwarf, and uh, specifically this game. I'm going to be looking at a game by Bobby Fisher. We're going to be looking at the 6F4, also known as the Amsterdam variation. So, busting things off right here, we've got a uh, pretty standard move order in the Nidwarf, and now with F4, 6F4, we got the Amsterdam variation. So, in this game, I've got white is the Macedonian I am, Risto Nisevsky versus Bobby Fischer as black, and this was Scope G 1967. So proceeding queen c7 in this game, Fischer was also known to play e5 immediately. And so after this, you know, he would go with queen c7 as well most of the time. So this was kind of a, you know, this, this was a pretty typical plan that Fischer employed um, back in the day, you know, in the in the 60s primarily, and, um, you know, Fisher was, the, the F4 line has always been somewhat of a sideline, it's definitely not the most topical lines, you know, not as popular as the Bishop C4 or the Bishop G5 or Bishop E2 systems, but the F4 move, you never know, you know, in the Sicilian people are constantly trying to get people out of their preparation by, by employing sidelines and, you know, getting out of the main, main line theory, and so F4, it's, it doesn't hurt to be prepared with, with some typical plans. So in this game, Fisher is, you know, he's, he's playing uh, knight bd7. I should also mention in this position, if knight d5, this would be a big blunder as queen a5 check here, and you're going to pick up that d5 pawn. So just a nice tactic to be aware of. So instead, now knight bd7 and, you know, trying to prevent e5 by white. And so with b5, Fisher is going for, uh, you know, pretty rapid pressure. A3 by uh, Nisevsky is as white. I mean, A3 makes sense. You don't want white to don't want black to play B4 and, and with all this pressure coming against the E4 pawn. So now with G6, Fisher is going for a double fianchetto, and you know you don't see this all the time, but it is something that happens against the F4 line as as black does get a little bit more leeway in the opening, and uh, a very interesting line. You know, a, a current GM that plays this, Sergey Kudrin, definitely plays in the U.S. And uh, it, it's pretty interesting, you know, the, the double fianchetto here. Black is getting good play. You know, his bishops are, are going to be having a very nice influence on the game. And if he manages to open the game, you know, he, he, everything is going to open up for Black. His, his position is really well placed for a long-term strategy. And so with e5 here, Fisher, instead of, uh, I, I should also note here, if e5 by white, Maybe we could see something like this, and if e6, I, I just guess this check here was Fisher's idea, and, and he can maybe pick up the pawn, even though it's not that pretty. You know, the pawn doesn't look that good here. It seems like maybe knight c5, he can try to hold on to it, and, and with the excellent piece play by black, I've got to think he's, he's doing okay here. Uh, knight takes h7, you can just take the bishop, and there's no tactic. Based, based on the, uh, the g6 pawn. Just a side note. So, <laughs> uh, instead, um, here, Nisetsky goes king h1, and so Fisher just plays e5. Instead of letting white, you know, trample all over him in the center, he takes a stand, and a yeah, pretty interesting idea. I think f5 by, by white was really the best move, but black does have nice control of the dark squares, and, and honestly, he can probably play d5 in the future, Seems like he's going to be just fine in either case. So here, queen h4, and it seems like white is really trying to push things towards something of a grand prix attack type structure. And so h6 by Fisher, he doesn't want to allow, let's say he castles f5, he doesn't want to allow this where white is going to get a very nice attack. You know, everything, all those pieces are really going crazy just in a rush to attack black's king. And it's difficult for black to create counterplay in that position without opening the center, which is very tough. So instead, h6, and uh, you know maybe he's also threatening to take the pawn. So here, white takes, pawn takes, and so in this position, Fisher plays knight c5. This was a nice move. You know, there's no need to rush things. It, it, g5 suggests itself for black, but honestly, knight c5 is a much more flexible move, much less committal, and why not just go ahead and try to finish your development? You know, or at least partially where the knight maybe is, is going to be able to jump in the center a little better. So here with knight h5, and black kind of caught up 
in in or, or White rather, you know, his queen kind of got caught up in, in some goofiness here on the king side, and with takes in this position after knight d5, you know, White does have a seemingly attractive position, you know. So we we had a big mess, you know, after the complications, the dust settles. What's going on, you know? So we've got Black has got the only dark squared bishop on the board, which is an absolute monster in defense. And, you know, it's, it's controlling quite a bit of critical squares, e5 and d4 in the, in the center specifically. And for white, white would really like to attack black's king before black is able to jump this rook over somehow, before black is able to develop the rook. And, you know, the, what, what makes the most sense is g3 here. The problem with g3, first of all, you don't want to take with the queen. It doesn't make any sense for white to trade queens Especially, you know, Black's just gonna he's gonna pick up these pawns and that's it. He's gonna be up two pawns. So instead, if if H takes, the problem is it, there's just no there's no future here. There's no sacrifice on e5 as after pawn takes the H file opens with check, and it seems like Black could probably just start munching on these pawns and and no problems. You know, I I don't know. I mean, something like that it certainly seems pretty good. Maybe he can uh, chop the bishop first. You know, there, there's a, there are some tactics for white. Let's see, something like this. This could be a little spicy. But maybe you just chop the bishop, scoop the pawn, and uh, it seems like I, there's really no way, you know, white can't bring the knight to e5 if queen f5, maybe even queen c8. This is an option, just based on black's dark square control. So I think this, this illustrates black's position looks a little goofy, but... There's really no way to crack open the position for white. So here he plays b4 just to get it off the diagonal. And in this position, Fisher decides to, I guess you could say he's transforming his positional advantage with the, the dark squared bishop being such a strong piece. And he plays queen c8. Just so typical of Fisher, sensing the, the, right, the right time to, to kind of trade pieces and go into a technical endgame. And uh, if, he, if he exchanges here, the pawn on d5 is very weak. And this bishop is on the right color to harass these pawns. So instead, white doesn't want to trade. He's trying to keep up the attack. And now Fisher's queen, extremely well placed. D6 was a nice move by white, you know, making a little stronghold here. But Fisher just rook D8. He snatches the pawn. And in this position, just king G8. So he, he's defending very well. This pawn looks like it's going to drop. Again, these pawns in the end game will most likely drop as well. All black needs to do is survive the attack. So white, trying to complicate things, uh, but you know we just repeat kind of moves, and now Fisher snatches another pawn. So he's really in no hurry. You know the thing is he can't move his king because then f7 is too weak. But you know he just leaves a king there, snatches another pawn, really in no hurry at all. Bishop f8, and now he snatches another pawn. And so the problem for white is again his king. Just, it's just stuck on the H file. <laughs> so here, White tries, you know, he, he's trying to get some counterplay. Fisher snatching pawns like crazy. And in this position, after knight d7, I think the game is pretty much over. Queen c6 was nice. We see this pin. Black is threatening to bring the rook over to h3. And so in the game, White played queen g4 and lost quickly. If he takes this on, uh, on f8, I think the following combination... Is pretty good for black. He can take here first. Say king here, queen b6, another check. And uh, I don't know, you could probably snatch this, you know, if you wanted. But maybe this, this kind of check is like a little bit uncomfortable here. Or you could just play check, snatch this guy, and pretty much just just picking up all of these pawns for black. And it, it looks like at the end of the combination, white just really doesn't have anything. He has absolutely nothing. I mean, the king here, maybe just take this. You know, white, black is up so many pawns. I mean, it just doesn't even matter. So, okay. So I think that combination is a good illustration uh, of what could have happened if knight takes f8. Instead, white played queen g4 after rook g3. He went on to lose the knight. He just dropped the knight. You know, the game's over. I mean, he, he can't move his queen here. He's, he's going to get mated. Queen g4 just not getting it done. 
But uh, here, Fisher just picks up the night, and, and that was it. So how Fisher, you know, the, the opening was pretty cool. I really like this plan with the double fianchetto because it just creates so much dynamic potential in Black's position, you know, for the long term and the short term. So kicking off with an early b5, that seems to be kind of the trademark of this line, having first play knight d7 to stop e5. And, you know, this was pretty much the basic structure of the opening. Fisher chose e5 here. Honestly, I can't blame him. I, I think a better try for white is to play f5. But that black will end up playing, he, black will achieve d5. And with it, he's going to achieve a pretty nice position. Or maybe he could just castle and play d5 immediately. That, that seems pretty good. So, okay, so moving on here, we're going to take a look by Gary, at a game by Gary Kasparov here. And playing white is the Icelandic GM Hans Stefansson. And Kasparov is black. This was in Reykjavik, 1995. So Kasparov also, you know, even Kasparov, I mean, this was in 95. Kasparov was killing everybody, and, and people are still busting F4 out. You know, so you got to know the lines. So here he plays Queen C7. And Kasparov also employed, uh, you know, this plan with E5. It, this really did seem to be, uh, you know, a very easy way for black to equalize against this F4 line, or one of the ways. But instead, Kasparov goes for G6 here. He changes his mind and wants to be in shadow as well. And so now Bishop E3. And Stephenson, as opposed to Knight F3 in the previous game, where White was trying to play E5 so fast, with Queen F3, White is really going for a, uh, you know, just centralized, I guess a centralized position. You know, and maybe he's trying to play F5. And also maybe he's trying to impede Black from playing B5 so early. And so Kasparov plays it anyway. You know, he has no problem with these complications. I think if if takes here, I think old Kasparov might have been playing to sack the exchange and pick up some pawns. To me, this looks very interesting. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything definitive about the, the line here. This looks very interesting. White's king is kind of stuck in the center. Black only has one extra pawn, but... You know, I, I don't know. It, it just looks like such a cool line. Maybe knight d7, you know, you gotta maintain the integrity here. But uh, anyway, you know, it's a moot point. Stephenson didn't play e5. But if bishop b7, I mean, this this just doesn't seem right. He's gotta play pawn takes here. And uh, now queen e2. And it seems, it seems uncomfortable for black. You know, I mean, you can still play bishop here and, and whatever, but I think maybe... I don't know. Black, Black has got play either way. You know, this, this is how, how things could have gone down if he fought. But instead, Bishop d3 by Stephenson. He, di he didn't want to get crazy. And Kasparov, provocatively, knight bd7. He's, you know, do you still want to play e5? And white declined. So now bishop b7. Black's got some nice pressure coming in here. And the knight's coming to c5, b4 in the future. And so white plays a3. He doesn't, he doesn't want to mess around too much. So bishop g7 by Black. And so now, you know, out of the opening here, I think black has got to be preferred. If white plays f5, it gives up the critical e5 square. And you better believe black is going to be getting some very nice counterplay on the dark squares, maybe even d5, trying to open up some mate threats in the future. So f5, you definitely don't want to do for white. Instead, white tries to just play prophylactically, you know, improves the position of his king. The bishop's out of harm's way. Now we can start playing with the rooks and open files in the center. And Kasparov, a very common maneuver in his games in the Sicilian, rerouting his knights to the queen side, where they're going to be able to put more pressure on the center. Also, the bishop is opened up now. And so a4, Stephenson can't find a more, a more productive plan. And so here, Kasparov, a little restructuring in the pawn on a5 will be a permanent weakness. So also, you know, white is tied down a6, but a lot easier for black to defend. And so here, Kasparov, a little transformation of advantages, transforming his positional pressure into a long-term advantage with this, you know, his pawn structure is just a lot better. The pawn on b4 is, is going to be something of a liability. Also, look at the activity of black's pieces. Now this diagonal is open, this diagonal is open, and uh, white's knight is on d1. <laughs> Enough said. So here, um, you know, we could have... Um, I think if queen takes, maybe queen takes e7, Kasparov didn't want to do this. You know, all these trades, not really going to help him out very much. Instead, he takes and just plays e5. And a very nice plan. 
you know, instead of chasing the pawn, we can see white is totally pushed back with the bishop here, the knight here, and, you know, this bishop is the best piece on the board. So Kasparov immediately sets about just trying to make it work, trying to open the bishop with f4. You know, now he's, queen c4 was nice, a little pressure. Maybe the queen is, is also defending any checks here. And so bishop b6, white is just fighting for activity. And after rook f8 and e4, this is a picture-perfect attack by black. Now, material's dead even, but with this bishop as a monster, this bishop as a monster, and these two pawns, black has got a winning attack here. And so with rook f7, just you know, go, go ahead and defend a little bit, no worries. A couple of exchanges, and now f3, the game is completely over. There's just the, the bishop is just too strong. So after a few exchanges, now bishop d5 didn't want to... Um, I guess he didn't want to allow d5 and any kind of sacrifice. Oh, bishop d5, playing it safe, snatches a pawn, and now the end is just, you know, the rook is going to penetrate on one of these squares and open up the bishop. So knight h3, and here Kasparov just hits on the winning plan, tries to sacrifice the rook, and in this position, I, I think white resigns shortly. If he takes here, the idea is check, and followed by mate. Like, uh, whoa, you know, this is real. <laughs> so, so the mate, I mean, this is not looking good. White is in trouble. So he tries queen g5, and, and he just, Kasparov just trades, picks up the pawn on d4, and white resigned. Because it, he, he can't stop f2. The game is completely over. So in this game, Kasparov, looking at the opening, was fairly similar to uh, the game we looked at by Fisher. You know, I stayed away from, I guess, the main lines here with e5. Uh, as I thought, the double fanchetto lines were, were pretty cool. You know, I think it was a really nice way of responding to this sideline. And I think the long-term pressure offered by black setup is, is just excellent. You know, you really take white out of, uh, out of his comfort zone with this type of double fanchetto. And right around here, I think Kasparov just, black has an excellent position. White was unable to find counterplay, so he, he made some weakening moves. And uh, once, once the position opened up, especially this bishop, the game was really over. So that's going to conclude this, this uh, you know, video on the uh, 6F4, the Amsterdam variation. And in the DVD, I, I checked out in quite a bit more detail the standard main lines and also a couple more Fiat Shadow games. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.